podcast episode one here we go welcome welcome to the pod don't even have a name for it yet but we'll figure that out as we go this podcast just a little intro is all going to be about performance and pretty much i'm gonna do some solo episodes talking about different areas of performance main focus of course around training biomechanics physiology developing different physical qualities learning and pretty much my general interests um, along the way hopefully I can get some good guests on to kind of broaden my horizons learn a bit myself and share some good quality information initially the first few episodes are going to be focused on hypertrophy that's going to be the main topic for the initial initial few episodes and then once I get cracking hopefully I can get a few guests on to talk about hypertrophy as well building muscle and we will go from there but welcome to the pod first episode here we go um so i'm just going to talk about my experience with building muscle over the years i've been lifting now for over probably about 13 years which is crazy to say i started in my bedroom with this like old easy curl bar from my dad that he gave me i think it was from his dad as well like classic story um, and I just started like with the basics, bicep curls, of course. And I want to talk about kind of my struggles with trying to build muscle. Um, and I think I'm, I've never been a particularly good athlete. Um, I wouldn't say I'm naturally gifted in too many physical qualities that i found maybe there are some hiding but particularly building muscle that's something i struggled with so much um which is kind of why or in my opinion when you struggle with something you have to figure out everything about it if i was good at it the first time i wouldn't really know the reasons why because i'm just naturally good at it um you we always we all probably know those people i don't know at school that just started lifting weights and they could bench press like a hundred kilos which is a good amount of weight or they've never lifted before and then in the mid-20s they squat and they're squatting 120 i have friends who've all done these things never lifted came to the gym with me and they are already stronger than me um and that is just a typical story and across these 12 13 years of lifting i've learned a lot in particular the last two three years about things that were potentially missing from my training when I was younger and mistakes I made along the way. And I'm going to share a few stories about that, that path for me of progression, of learning, of actually eventually understanding principles, putting them into play and then developing a good amount of tissue. So I've had some very good periods of training with regards to building muscle, gotten a lot stronger, put on a lot of weight, good weight, good size, um, and this is me gonna go over them. So when I first started lifting, it was in my bedroom, good, just the best times. I remember even having friends over <laughs> for sleepovers and we would just go crazy lifting weights and also simultaneously smashing beers, um, which is an interesting thing. So for me growing up, like those years, 14 to 18, I was training pretty hard, maybe lifting like three to five times a week, pretty consistently, plus a load of other things. But the results over those years, from my perspective, were just so below par. I remember what a friend of mine, Aiden, he lifted for like six months at home with a couple dumbbells. And I'd already been going for the gym for maybe four years at this time. So like trained at home and then I went to the gym once I out, outgrew my weights and he made better progress in about six months than I had in four years. I just remember his arms blowing up and I was like, what am I doing wrong? Like, how am I so bad at this? Um, and of course, it was, was a young guy. I was like, come on, this sucks. I'm so insecure. I've been training for so long and this my mate has just blown up. This is ridiculous. Um, but there were loads of factors, loads of factors. And I used to genuinely just blame it on genetics. And that is 100% a factor, but that's not really helpful with regards to kind of making progress and actually creating adaptations. So genetics aside, 
I, there is always room to improve with things that you can control. Always room to improve with things you can control and that blaming it on genetics, that's something, something in the past. You, your genetics are your genetics. You can't change that, but you can change what you do in the gym, what you do outside of the gym. So a few key principles that I'm going to cover. Um, if you want to develop any physical quality, speed, strength, building muscle, mobility, cardiovascular ability, do you want to be able to run forever? Do you want to be able to cycle forever? Do you just want to run really fast for 10 minutes? Any kind of physical quality, the number one principle is you kind of, well, you don't kind of, you have to be specific. You have to do the work towards that physical quality by doing that. Damn, you, have, you have to do the damn thing. If you want to get jacked, you have to lift weights. You have to kind of create a stimulus in the muscle to get some good adaptation. And I, I ticked that box. I was specific. When I was young, I lifted weights. But the nuances and how I lifted weights and the other things outside of that, that's really where the limitations came about. Because I was lifting weights hard, man, three to five times a week. But I was also doing a lot of sport. I was playing hockey three times a week. I was running a few times a week as well. I was drinking heavily on the weekends. All of these things come into play with regards to the results that you're going to get. You have a certain amount of energy to give in any area of your life. And if you're spreading it out, even if you're being specific and you're getting the work done to create those physical adaptations, if you've got a bunch of other things interfering, you're just not going to get as solid results. So maybe my friend, he wasn't doing half that other sh shit that I was doing. Um, so if you want to develop muscle, if you want to kind of build some muscle, you've got to be specific. You've got to do the damn thing. And honestly, you can't do too much else if you want spectacular results. If you want results that like people would notice in the short term, you have to be pretty dialed in with regards to predominantly spending a lot of your energy just lifting weights with regards to physical activity you can't you probably can't drink of course this is genetic depending and you have some like psychos out there who will get results no matter what but what i'm talking about is like some kind of exceptional change in the way you are the way you look your strength and things like that over a short period you can chip away forever and I did this for maybe nine or 10 of these 12 to 13 years, just chipping away, doing a little bit of hypertrophy work in the gym, which I'll dive into a little bit deeper later, what that kind of entails. And doing that, you do slowly build muscle. But what I'm really discussing here is the precise principles to create fast adaptations in a sh shorter period of time by dialing everything in so what that would look like is you're, you're training in the gym two to six times a week um, and the rest of your life almost resolves around that your sleep is dialed in your nutrition is dialed in the training itself is dialed in you don't have too much stress going on or these other interfering factors that's really how you get these immense changes and it doesn't take that long you need like three to six months if you've never done a period of training like this before to get absolutely exceptional results um, and and i'm going to talk about what you need to do to get that to so being specific, you've got to do the damn work um, with less interference if you want better results. It's a spectrum, right? The more energy you put towards building muscle and the less energy you put towards other things, the greater your results will be. That's pretty logical, pretty obvious, but obviously my dumb ass 10 years ago couldn't figure that out. I was like, why am I not making gains when I'm smashing like 10 to 20 beers on the weekend and doing so much sport to a pretty high level that, that I, I just like just logical fallacies I, I didn't know why I wasn't making as good gains as some of my friends but that was one of the main reasons um, another main reason and this is 
when I implemented this strategy, everything in my training changed. So if you've trained with me, if you've seen my training right now, there's one thing I kind of pride myself on in an individual set. It's bringing the relative intensity, overloading the system. Now, back in the days, I always thought I was training hard, like sets were hard. If you see my facial expressions, I was grafting. There's old YouTube videos of me really pushing it. But the reality was the intensity wasn't quite there. The overload on my body, on my current muscular system wasn't sufficient to cause big adaptations. And I'm, once I started measuring this, giving it a bit of objectivity with regards to how to measure intensity rather than just absolute weight on the bar or percentage of your one rep max on the bar. For me, with regards to hypertrophy, the, the most convenient and effective way to measure your intensity and your progress is repetitions from failure. How many reps do you have in reserve once you've finished a set? Failure being you can no longer do a single rep even if someone held a gun to your head. That's failure um, where you try and do a rep and you like are shaking and you've got blood vessels popping in your eyes. That's failure. That's the point that you want to focus on with regards to measuring your intensity. You've got to get close to that place. You've got to get cl close to that dark place within sets. You have to bring the intensity. Because something I didn't understand, like I would do hard sets and they were hard, but they just weren't hard enough. Like everyone's trained and they're like, oh, this is hard. That was a good hard set. But the reality is there is always more to give. There is always so much more to give. Um, so once I had this perspective of, all right, I'm going to measure my sets with regards to this proximity to failure and getting the last five reps away from failure, those are your most effective reps. And this is exceptionally hard to measure. There's been countless studies on advanced lifters, people who've been lifting for five to 10 years and newbies, and they estimate like what their 10 rep max is. And they've been like five to 10 reps off consistently in the, in the studies. Um, which is just like a prime example of how hard it is to be objective and be true to yourself and actually be accurate with your predictions in the gym. This is why it's so important to go to failure once in a while to really push and test yourself to see where you're at and to have that marker that you can base the rest of your training off. So once I started implementing this, I my my gains kind of transformed. It's this and a few other things that really, really made the difference. But bringing the intensity, getting that overload in the system is the, the huge thing. Because when I was growing up, like I used to watch a bunch of YouTube videos on training. And Hodge Twins, if you know them, they're legends, YouTube guys. Twin Muscle Workout, I think was their YouTube name. And they were going through this phase of, oh, you don't need to train to failure to get good results. And that is 100% true, but my dumb ass interpreted that as I don't need to go to failure. And then when you never go to failure, you never really understand what you're capable of. And then your kind of point in which you base the re remainder of your training off is going to be slightly off. So for me, it's very important to go to failure when you want to develop muscle. So you have that standard to base the rest of your training. Just the experience of a really, really hard set is foundationally important for the rest of your training. I'm just gonna grab a sip of coffee. Got a good coffee here. And we'll keep we'll keep diving into this a little bit further. Oh, banger. Absolute banger. And Intensity needs to be as objective as possible um, when you're doing it. So like things like standardizing your form, standardizing your reps, having a slow controlled negative or eccentric portion of the movement, having pauses in there, implementing a tempo, standardizing the range of motion. It's so easy for my young ego ass to just 
put more weight on the bar and reduce the range of motion like an idiot and you're not really progressing there you're just challenging the muscles in a shorter range which like is it progress or is it just same stimulus but a little bit different there's 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 a really little nice concept that i like thinking about and it's like you can there's two different types of hard you have the easy hard way and you have the hard hard way and the easy hard way is how i would describe my training in the past it was like i would go in i would get a part i'll be like oh this is hard training i'm attacking the weights i'm not resting that long i'm just going for it bringing the energy putting it in attacking it but i use momentum but i didn't rest long enough for my kind of other systems in the body to kind of recover so my muscle muscular system was the limiting factor my cardiovascular system might have been the limiting factor my neurology might have been the limiting factor you've got to rest properly and i was just getting too pumped up too excited in the gym to co- create that good stimulus that you need so when you calm down you'd be a bit more objective and do hard hard training rather than this easy hard and hard hard training for me is you standardize the range every single rep looks very very similar almost identical it's controlled when you progress you progress in a way that doesn't change these other factors that i've just discussed the reps look good they look clean when you see someone training in the gym and they have good form it's 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 a it's artwork it's beautiful i'm gonna cry but that those are those are super important things it's so like i i would have this mindset when you go in the gym and you want to build muscle of make your sessions hard hard not just like all right i'm gonna get the music on i'm gonna pump i'm gonna do this, this run around the gym do minimal rest oh that's i'm sweating this is good this is I'm, I'm, i feel like i'm working hard and the the reality is you are working hard but you're just not going to get as good results um because you're kind of you're challenging your ego rather than the actual system in your body that you want to adapt which is your muscular system and that doesn't really care about your ego or like oh how hard you think you're working like my dumb ass used to do and there's a place for this like dumb ass easy hard training like you just want to clear your head you had a shit day and you just want to you don't want to think too much you just want to go but i i really believe that the more you put into something the more you will get out of it and that is just true across across time. My camera time is flashing at me. I don't know why, but we'll keep keep cla- cra- cracking on. Sorry for interrupting the pod. I'm just here to advertise the programs. A couple programs in the link in the bio, in the link tree. Hypertrophy program if you want to get jacked out of your nut. And the fundamentals program if you're a bit bored of your training you want to mix it up you're fed up of just lifting weights in the gym and you want to come a little bit more athletic dive in to the link tree and get involved now um so that's the main thing make sure you challenge make sure you overload the system that you're working with if it's the muscular system which we're talking about today you've got to change it you've got to cl- train within that close proximity to failure most of your sets should be about two to three reps away from failure with occasionally testing um, and warm-up sets don't count so you should only count working sets when you are in that close proximity to failure two five to one rep away from failure most of the sets again two to three reps away from failure and that counts as a working set so this again, and this, bring, this opens the conversation up to, to volume of work. Growing up again, this was like, did anyone hear that roar? Jesus, coffee. Stomach is talking to me. But growing up, I was like, all right, volume's key. You want to build muscle, volume's key. But again, the thing missing in my dumb ass was like, volume of what? Marathon runners, triathletes, do more volume than anyone. They're training like 40 plus hours a week, training, which is crazy. And they aren't exactly Ronnie Coleman. They're not exactly the biggest people in the gym. They're not even in the gym. They're outside on the bikes. And 
more important than volume, it's volume of what, which takes us back to this first principle that we discussed or second principle that we discussed of intensity, of overload, of training in a close proximity to failure. So the easiest and most functional way for me to measure volume is these number of difficult sets, these number of sets that have a close proximity to failure where you're really challenging the system that you're trying to adapt. That is a that is how you manage it. So one of these sets where you're getting like two to three reps away from failure, really driving hard, the velocity of the movement is reduced. That counts as a working set. That's how we're going to measure our volume for the sakes of this conversation. And I think it's the most functional way to do it. So you can measure your sets in terms of, measure your volume, sorry, with regards to number of sets per week rather than like reps times weights times sets which for me is just like who's do, who's pulling out the calculator and doing that maybe 0.01 percent of people in the gym and even then is it still the best way to measure your sets probably not it's so much more functional to just think like all right i'm going to aim to do three hard sets on my chest today let's go get those work rather than i'm going to do a thousand kilos of of work in my chest or a thousand volume units arbitrary volume units but you're not considering the overload or intensity when you're measuring that volume so you're kind of just it's just arbitrary you're measuring without a point to measure it off and that's where this intensity principle comes into play you're giving yourself a standard to measure that volume across which I just think like I didn't get that like it took me so long I said I'm a shit athlete. Like it takes me ages to figure things out, but then you, I get the nuances. And you're probably listening to this. You're like, yeah, Jacob. Why did it take you so long to figure that out? I I knew that directly. Awesome, awesome. I'm just preach. I'm just saying this. I'm preaching. I'm preaching to the people <laughs> because it took me ages to figure out. But someone else is probably struggling with it as well. So if you get this directly and you have this kind of intuition when you just train that. You've got to be close to failure. You've got to train really, really hard. Awesome for you. Great. But this is pro this is more the reasonings why behind that. And a good way to kind of functionally, functionally manage and test your training over time. Going back to this intensity, there's one thing I want to dive a little bit deeper on is why you need to go close to failure. Do you hear that? My stomach is speaking. You might not even heard that, but I'm like, like a lion roaring. My uh, guts are going crazy over this coffee. They love it. Um, but why? Why do you need to go close to failure? Like that's the question. Why? Why is that important? Who actually cares? Um, well, your muscle system cares. Your muscular skeletal system cares. That's who. That's what's dictating this need. This need for failure. And in order to create adaptation. So why do we need to go to failure? So the leading driver, the, the hypothesized leading driver of hypertrophy is mechanical tension, which is you can just think about the force created within your muscle, within the actual muscle tissue, the tension created within that muscle. And you want that to be sufficient to cause an adaptation, to send the signal to your central nervous system to other systems in your body that, that like oh this muscle's working very very hard can we please give it some more stuff to make it manage this load better in the future so you need to challenge the challenge that system you need to challenge each individual muscle by creating this intensity within your individual sets which will lead to mechanical tension so what are we looking for how can we guarantee that we're creating enough guarantee i'm talking in likelihood so how can we increase the likelihood of creating that stimulus creating that adaptation and what we're looking for is a reduction in the velocity of the movement so when you start a set and you're moving with intent, you're controlling the eccentric, you're controlling the way down, potentially a pause in there, you're concentric, the way up, the way up from a squat, the way up from a bench press, um, the way up from a deadlift, picking it up to the, to the hips, from the floor to the hips. All of these parts of your movement, when you start, the velocity, the movement of the bar, the speed of the bar will be higher 
then later in the set. As you progress through a set, your velocity should decrease. As you're challenging the system more, as you're getting closer to failure, your body is asking to recruit more muscles. As those initial fibers get fatigued, um, as the weights get relatively heavier because of this fatigue, you need a, a greater amount of muscle tissue to move the weights. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for maximum recruitment within those tissues. You can think about a power lifter versus a, a uh, triple jumper. A power lifter, when they're moving, the velocity that they're moving when they're doing a one rep max, go and watch Thor do the world record deadlift. It's an extremely slow lift. Why is it extremely slow? The velocity is low because the force is so high. So you have a force velocity curve in physics. As the force increases, the velocity reduces. So in order for you to recruit and produce maximum forces within your tissues, the velocity needs to be reduced. So from that first rep towards failure, the velocity should be reduced over time. And that gives us an indication that we are causing a significant enough stimulus to adapt the system. So the rep should get slower. To put it bluntly, towards the end of your sets, when you're putting in max effort on the way up, on the concentric part of the lift, the reps should get slower. Now that is something that's essential. And when you finish a set as well, just while we're on the topic, your muscles should be tired. They should feel like, oh, I've been doing a little bit of work here. My uh, my boobies hurt. My chest muscles hurt. My quads hurt. If you don't have that, if you don't have like a blood in the what you're probably not training hard enough or you're not doing a controlled enough set, you should feel almost, particularly towards the end of your workout, but... Honestly, if you're training properly, the first few sets should be hard. Like, your muscles should be tired instantly. You should have a pump. Like, Arnold talks about the pump, yeah. It's absolutely essential. And um, that's just an, a separate outcome. You're talking about, like, metabolite accumulation in the tissues. Now, there's some evidence to show that that's not the main thing to cause hypertrophic adaptation it is this mechanical tension again that's the most likely theoreticized um, outcome for hypertrophy in the gym so we're mainly looking for this reduction in velocity large amount of muscle recruitment high, high levels of force um, rather than just getting a pump so those are a couple things with regards to intensity that I missed that I'm just bringing back in um, awesome. I'm going to take a quick pause just to reset the camera. Actually, no, let's keep going and see if it uh, stops. Apparently, the camera only gives me 30 minutes of recording, but we will see. We will push through and we will see. So those are a few things. Intensity, like I'm going to talk about that a lot. I'm going to preach that a lot. So when you next go to the gym and you try a set out, I want you to try and experience going to failure and film your set. Is your first rep, is your first rep significantly faster than your last? Your last rep should be slow and brutal and you should be feeling, you should be questioning your lifestyle choices towards the end of some sets, um, particularly if you go into failure and film them and send them to me. I'm very, very curious. And I'll tell you, I'll give you my opinion. Do I think you're going close enough to failure? We shall see. We shall see, son. Um, or daughter. Yeah, it's weird. But yeah, anyway intensity and then managing the amount of volume how many of these hard sets should you do that's the next question if you've never done them before if you've never really lifted weights that much doing these hard sets for hypertrophy you can probably just do one or two sets per session and you'll get a good stimulus you'll probably be sore the next day but that won't last long there's, a, there's some evidence showing like you need to do like three to four sets is your minimum effective dose to make progress in the gym. Three to four hard working sets rather than just any set. So three to four hard working sets per muscle group per week. It's not even per session. So you could do, say you train chest twice a week. 
that would be two hard sets per session. That's it. That's crazy. That, think how low that volume is. But there's loads of evidence showing that that is sufficient to make progress over time. And I'm not talking about maximal progress. I'm just talking about minimum effective dose. So most people should probably keep that in their training routine year round, hitting muscles, muscle groups every. So managing volume like three to three to four sets per body part per week that's absolutely nothing and you can progress with that that's something you can you should probably keep in year round if you care about like longevity and things like that because building muscle bone density these kinds of things that you get from this style of training will come of course if you're an absolute unit and you've built loads of muscle and you don't really want to build any more you don't think you need any more that's something else then you probably don't need it but I'm talking about generally, general population, four sets per body part per week. It's not that hard. You can get that done in an hour's work. Um, it will be a brutal workout, <laughs> but you're probably better splitting it over two days. Um, but that that's like, like that, that is the minimum standard for training is so achievable. People talk about, I don't have time for things. Well, you have a choice to make time. That's, that's it's your life. But... Even I would propose, I like to use the language, I haven't made time this week to get training in. Rather than say, I didn't have time. I think that's useful, useful language to use. But anyway, to get back to this point, imagine that you can progress with one hours per week of lifting. Like, who doesn't have an hour in their week? You can split that up into three 20 minute sessions. Anyone can find that kind of time. It's just these this knowledge these principles like they open a whole world of adaptation of training of progress that i didn't think was possible for i thought you'd had to train like six times a week when i reduced my training so i could up this intensity i got better results when i did three to four sessions a week i got some of the best results i've ever had versus six sessions a week because when you do a lot of volume it's so much harder to bring the intensity. It's so much harder to cause an overload in the system. That was my huge mistake growing up. Like I was doing too much, too much, way too much. And you'll probably be on either one of the spectrum of not doing enough or doing too much. And the reality is most people will have to come and meet in the middle and trying to find this magic spot. But as a standard for yourself, try and commit to at least three out of four weeks every month to doing four hard sets per body part per week, four sets of bench press, four sets of squats, four sets of some kind of rowing action, four sets of some hinge, that's it. That ch challenges every single muscle in the body pretty much and you can get in and out of the gym within an hour. And that is just like, that could be transformational for your life. That's fuck it. That gets me buzzing, just thinking like that, an hour. And I've seen it with clients. One hour, they've been making huge progress. One hour a week, I've seen females get a pull-up that they've never been able to get a pull-up before. I've seen men develop a lot of strength. Just one hour a week applying these principles. That's just brilliant to me. But you have to bring the intensity. Um, and that now we're just talking about the minimum effective dose. But what about extending that? What about our heroes that are shooting for the maximum. I wanna max out my training. I've got a bit of free time now. Um, I just stopped a sport. I just wanna get back in the gym. I've got three to six days that I can commit to the gym. What should I do to max out my gains? To squeeze every single drop out of the lemon, the lemon of gains. And what you're looking for is your maximum recoverable volume. So when you first get in the gym, you're looking at about four sets per body part per week as a minimum. But that can go up to 20 to 30 working sets per week, which, just to clarify, is absolutely horrendous. If you're doing 20 to 30 sets per body part per week, with this, all of those sets within close proximity to failure, two, three reps away from failure, you should be historically fatigued. You should be like, ow. Ow, 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 my body is in bits, my sleep. You will sleep like eight to 10 hours like it's nothing. You will be starving. Uh, 
when you're up at this like higher end of training volume and it's a nice experience to go through and that's when you'll see amazing amazing results when you're up at that higher end of the volume i wouldn't recommend that year round it's very hard to maintain of course if it's your life and it's your only hobby for example you could keep cracking um, I don't enjoy training like that year round, but I do try and do a period of that each year when I want to really develop some muscle. Um, I think it's very, very beneficial, and that's really where you'd get most of the gains from doing this like three to six month period of pushing from four working sets per week up to 20 to 30. Like, I've never done 30 working sets per week on a muscle group, and I maybe I will at some point but like for me that is just absolutely insane that amount of volume because my set like, I'll do I'll do like four hard sets in a, in a session and I'm destroyed like I don't know how because if you think about 30 sets if even if you do six sessions that's still five sets per session per body part like that's mad and when I hear people say oh I did 50 sets in that workout how many of those sets were an absolute waste of time? This is why I generally hate when someone is programmed three sets of 10 when they're trying to get hypertrophy as the desired outcome. Three sets of 10 with zero intensity markers or it's all at the same percentage of your one at max, that's missing this intensity principle completely. Because the first, if you can maintain the same weight, the first two sets of 10 or whatever three sets of 10 you're probably nowhere near failure if you're getting close to failure your reps should drop off at if you if the weight's the same the form's the same because you're fatigued fatigue will kick in and it's a big telltale sign for me if you're doing say four sets of 10 and you can do four sets of 10 the same weight with the same like effort amount on each of those sets like the, the reps should drop off if you're training close enough to failure that's that's a big thing and you should be a little bit sore after your workouts like that was a huge thing for me. Like, I always heard you don't need to be sore in order to build muscle which is true it's true in the theory it's true you don't need to be sore but it's extremely useful to have the experience of being sore because without that without that experience of being sore you never really know if you're training hard enough you never really know if you're even targeting the tissues like i think everyone should try and be sore at least one or two weeks out of the month and if this is your only focus three weeks out of the month you should be sore when you're not trying to bring your fatigue back down it's just a better you're increasing the likelihood of causing a stimulus if you're doing that rather than if you're never sore, are you really training hard enough? That's that's a huge question on my mind because I was never really that sore when I was training back in the days. Whereas when I've had these periods of ridiculous gains, gaining five kilos in three months and not too much body fat, all the lifts going up in ridiculous, ridiculous numbers. I'm talking progress each week if not every other week, when I'm 10 years into my lifting career. That's the kind of progress you should expect if you're dialing in these principles. Like, it's the best way to get stronger. Um, if you're a bit more advanced, it might be slightly slower. But I was 10 years in, I started applying these principles. I reduced the total volume, up the, up the intensity, and the outcomes were unreal. Like, I never thought I would be getting close to benching the 50 kg dumbbells but they're on the radar. Like the adaptations were huge, 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 10, 20, 30, 30% 30 in increases in weights that I was using. That's ridiculous just by applying this print, these principles. Intensity is the main one, managing your volume, making sure you're not doing too much um, simply because like there's a relationship between the volume and fatigue that you're going to do. A relationship between the stimulus that you're bringing into your muscles and the fatigue that's going to happen to your like central nervous system generally to your body and locally to the tissues so you really need to be aware of this and that's when you're kind of choosing exercises 
that don't leave your joints destroyed the next day. Choosing exercises that leave your muscles sore, that create a lot of stimulus, but you're not leaving the gym with like these other tissues that you're not targeting being beaten up. For example, back squats. Are back squats the best thing for hypertrophy? For most people, probably not. You're better off being in a machine with more stability. So exercise selection is a huge, huge, huge topic and something that you can consider when you are going through this this process of developing tissue, developing muscle tissue. So we've covered a lot so far. So we like we talked about the intensity, talked about managing the volume a little bit, um, even talked a little bit about exercise sele- selection and the the theory behind some of these things. I'm I'm gonna leave it there today, just that first episode, and let me know what you think. Drop me messages couple of the hypertrophy principles talked about the two most important three most important ones be specific intensity and volume i hope you enjoyed the the chat um and yeah i hope you have a great day